All right, well, hello everyone and welcome to the webinar, how to get the most out of team projects and retain your sanity in virtual environments. My name is Jordan Novak and I lead the products and services teams here at Capsim. So why are we holding this webinar? Well, a few weeks back, we surveyed our professors to better understand how COVID-19 has impacted them over the past several months. Overwhelmingly, the biggest concern raised is getting student groups to collaborate effectively in an online environment. To help us kind of better understand how to do this effectively, we've asked my good friend and colleague, Dr. Eric Deerdorf from DePaul University to lead this webinar. Dr. Deerdorf is a regular contributor to the Science of Teams, publishing his work in leading journals such as the Journal of Management and the Academy of Management Journal, and is currently an associate editor at Personnel Psychology. He also consults on issues of training effectiveness and high-performing teams for organizations such as General Electric, the National Football League, and the U.S. Navy SEALs. In the university classroom, he's an avid user of team-based simulations. We know you will find the webinar both interesting and highly practical as you, tack as you tackle your own challenges of implementing team projects in blended and virtual environments. Welcome, Dr. Eric Deerdorf. Please take it away. Well, thanks, Jordan. I appreciate that. Hello, everyone. Well, certainly 2020 has been a, quite a year, right? Um, and unfortunately, it seems like the uncertainty and challenges uh, aren't really subsiding here in the coming months. Um, I'm sure I'm not unique here. Just uh, two hours ago, I got an email from university administration shifting again what we're going to do this uh, fall term. We're removing pretty much every course online whereas we were doing some hybrid uh, courses. So I imagine I'm not alone in that. Um, so welcome, I'm really happy to uh, have some of your time today and try to uh, make the most of it. What I really hope we can accomplish today is straightforward. Um, really to make team-based projects more productive and seamless for you and more engaging and effective for your students as we continue to adapt to this virtual instruction that's being thrust upon us. And so even if you've been someone who's used team projects for a number of years or you've been teaching in the virtual environment for, for a number of years, um, there's still a number of things that we can talk about that we can glean that you'll still find value. Although I say the overarching goal is straightforward, it doesn't mean it's not without some obstacles to overcome, which are in part linked to various beliefs that are common about teams. So let's talk a little bit about a few of these. For example, we often think the best teams are built with top performers. The most effective teams require strong team leaders. Personalities are the primary drivers of team success or failure. Or that a three-person team does three times or more work than one person. Good project management leads to cooperation or conflict is an essential ingredient for a great team. And finally, this one, virtual teams are totally different than face-to-face -face teams. So these are things that are very commonly held both in academics as well out as out in organizations. But, you know, in fact, many of these even have entire books based on them, believe it or not. But here's the rub. All of these are at best half truths or at worst, totally false. If you look at um, decades now we have of research on team effectiveness. And so I show you these to illustrate the need for everyone to better understand what makes for an effective or ineffective team. This understanding has huge implications for how we manage the team projects that are in our classes, right? So how's the saying go? You know, teamwork makes the dreams work, as they say. So the truth is, we actually do know a lot about team performance. Team science stretches back at least five decades, concerted research. And so it's really not a mystery what makes for a highly high-performing team or a low-performing team. And so in this talk today, I'll try to draw from this rich literature to offer specific tactics to improve your team projects. And so I applied an additional filter on these uh, recommendations when I was building this talk uh, that Jordan asked me to do, is I wanted to only include tactics that are easy to implement. In other words, ones that you can start using immediately, because I mean, fall term is right around the corner. It's starting next week for many of you. And so what are things we can do right away? That was kind of the emphasis. These are also tactics that I've used personally and found to work well um, over the course of my own teaching, which you know, as I was thinking about this talk, I realized it's almost 20 years now. <laughs> I didn't know if I needed that reminder. So I think probably the first place we should start 
is really talk about the idea of what are the main components of team performance? Because we have to understand team performance if we want to manage these team projects, right? And so in any team, doesn't matter if it's a student team, a work team, um, surgical team, you name it, there's two primary requirements. There's what we call task work, and then there's teamwork. So task work is, you know, getting the, the actual technical tasks done, right? Uh, doing the analyses, running the, running the numbers, um, creating the deliverables, making decisions but you also have teamwork, and that's the social interactions that facilitate completing those tasks. And so in this talk today, we're gonna to focus here on the teamwork component. And this is where uh, most people um, are in need of help when it comes to team projects. I mean, if you just step back and think of it, you know, after all, task work really covers the very subject matter on which you are already the expert. That's why you're teaching that class, right? If you're teaching a strategy class or an accounting class or a marketing class. So we really want to focus on the other stuff, right? That really drives uh, uh, home successful or unsuccessful team projects, the teamwork aspect. And so as I was building this talk, I really wanted to uh, make it practical. So I wanted to try to create a structure that, that made, it, made the most practical sense. Um, so I tried to think, well, if we're thinking of team projects, let's step back and think of the general flow of, of any team project. You have kind of the broad startup phase where you're pooling people together, right, into teams, and then the in-process stuff where they're actually doing the work, um, trying to ta accomplish the task, pull together the project, and then finally the wrap-up stage where they're uh, taking away that learning, right, as individuals as they depart that team. And so as we move through these general phases, we'll try to address some key questions like, how do I know when to use a team? Uh, how do I build teams, prepare them for success uh, during in-process phases? How do I handle non-compliant members, recognize problems, boost collaboration? And then finally, in the wrap-up, this idea, how do I ensure that both individuals and uh, team-level learning is happening? And then the real practical stuff, like evaluating and grading performance. Obviously, this is not an exhaustive list. We're only here for a short time. But these are the issues that so often trouble instructors when they're using team projects. And as they shift them into virtual environments, these kinds of struggles can become exacerbated. Another thing I tried to do when I was building this talk is really um, create a structure with that uh, emphasizes some of the practicality. So all the information here is structured in a very particular uh, manner to make it easier for us to cover a little bit more ground in a comprehensible way. So whenever you see sort of a blue, uh, excuse me, a, a blue rectangle at the top, this is some conclusion drawn from the research literature. Things in the red on the right, these are things to avoid or see, so common mistakes. Whereas things on the left, things to start doing. The ready to implement tactics you'll find here. Whenever you see a tactic that has the orange uh, pointer, the orange uh, uh, arrowhead, these are tactics that require just a little bit more effort. So I wanted to separate out things that you can literally do with very little effort right away versus things that are still easy to implement but take a little bit more time, a little bit more effort to do. And then finally, anything that's in a blue box that you see on the bottom right um, is an example uh, or, a, or a tip for using um, one of the tactics that's being recommended. Okay, I should also note logistically, now that we're talking about the webinar legend, is that this recording will be made available to you, so will the slide decks. There'll be a lot of information here, some real life examples of things you can use that you can uh, copy and paste right into your own syllabi and, and team projects. So don't worry, all that will be made available to you. Don't worry about trying to scribble everything down uh, <laughs> too quickly. Just sit back, focus, and listen, and feel free to uh, type in questions along the way. Jordan will be feed, fielding them, and we'll have time to address those in the end as well. So let's get right into it. So let's think about this idea of the startup phase. And so if we're thinking about our team projects, we should really, even before we start rolling these out, we should ask a really fundamental question, knowing when to use teams. The research tells us that in both academic and organizational contexts, teams are often misunderstood, mismanaged, and misused. The idea that we often throw teams onto a project when it really isn't even made for a team. So it begs the most fundamental question, do I even need a team to do this project or this assignment in class? This is a, a key question to address. So you wanna usually avoid using team, teams if it's only to create less grading for you, comply with a request from the dean, to do something with teams, or merely just to cope with online teaching. Now I say these uh, a little sheepishly because I've certainly uh, fell prey and I'm guilty of doing these, particularly in my early in my career. I much rather grade 
10 papers than 50 papers, right? But the key is here, don't use teams just because of those reasons, right? You wanna make sure the project is, is, is um, fit for a team. So how do we know that? When should we apply teams? Well, teams should be used when the project is complex, multiple perspectives are needed, the tasks are interdependent, so the tasks are connected in some way, and then finally, when you can enhance fidelity. In other words, this is the way the work is done in, in the quote unquote real world, right? In teams. And if it meets these criteria, then it's a, it's, it's a good candidate to be a team-based project rather than an individual project. Now, if your administration's asking you to do these, if, if there's a real pressure to increase uh, uh, team projects um, in your delivery, certainly you can do that. Just redesign that project to ensure it meets those criteria on the left. So assuming now that we, uh, it is a good project that suits a team, right? It's well suited for teams. Then it comes to the next question. How do I build or compose my teams? So the research literature tells us composition matters, the way we compose teams matters, but its effects are not as large as we often think. Remember one of those half truths and myths was personality is a primary driver of team performance. At best personality accounts for about 10, 11% of all team performance differences, right? So it's not as large as we think, and it also depends on what factors are actually used. And so if we think about here, things to kind of avoid or cease doing, let's try not to uh, engage in overly complex team assignment rules. Um, there's no need for algorithms or machine-based learning <laughs> to make your team assignments here, right? I would also suggest that you refrain from self-selection, so self-forming teams. I realize that many of you use this approach already. I've used this approach in the past, allowing people to choose their own teams. And there are some benefits to this, but unfortunately the costs nearly always outweigh these benefits in most of the situations we face in our classes, where there's such a variety of experience levels, where people are wholeheartedly unfamiliar with each other. There's only small clusters of people who know one another. And in virtual environments, self-selection becomes even more difficult to implement in an effective way. We also, also want to avoid the, the too large or the too small uh, team. Here, again, there's, there's, there's no magic number for team size. A lot of times people ask me this. Um, but as they say, two people does not, does not a team make, right? Two people, a two-person team is not a team, it's a dyad. So the idea here is, you know, they, they need not to be too small. And once you get close to double digit teams, they tend to be too large. It really detracts from the collaboration and coordination that are needed to drive good uh, team performance. And so there's some variability here. The key question is, is, is there enough work to go around, right? And so what is that good size, right? Keep it between three or eight if you want a sort of a rule of thumb practical recommendation. Also try to avoid homogenous teams. So I've, I've come into account over the years, a lot of people who really um, get overly uh, complex in the way they assign teams will have all male teams or all female teams or teams that are composed of all finance majors or all marketing majors. In general, you want to avoid this in team projects. You want to have a dispersion of, of a variety of different people and different backgrounds in teams if you want to set yourself up for success. Now, things to start doing, the opposite of complex would be keep it simple. So what's the simplest approach? Well, random assignment, right? Just simply randomly assign people to courses. Now, a lot of us um, may wanna do a little bit more than that, be a little bit more mindful than pure random assignment, but random assignment is fine. And so here, what you wanna do, if, if you wanna make some assignment rules, make sure you're focusing on relevant factors. Now, there's a number of factors that research says are uh, we could use to compose teams. So I wanted to boil it down to two that really rise to the occasion, especially when it comes to uh, virtual teaming. And the first is functional expertise, and second is context expert experience. So typically it's good if you are teaching, say like a capstone class where you know you're going to have a lot of different majors in there, ensure that you disperse those majors across teams, right? Or if you're teaching at the graduate level, try to disperse the previous work experience, the type of jobs or roles people have in their work life across teams. On context experience, what becomes really relevant here is things around how comfortable and how effective, how often have people used uh, virtual tools, have participated in virtual projects previous to your class. 
Now, for those of you who want to go the extra mile, you can see the orange pointer there. There are some individual preferences or dispositional variables you could capture here during team formation. Again, this is for people who want to go the extra mile, things like preference for teamwork or psychological collectivism. Not necessarily needed, but for those people who want to go a little bit further. And so let's take a little bit of a deeper dive to give you a real life example of what you could do here to capture some relevant factors. Look, many of our learning management systems already have a survey function involved that you could use, or you could leverage SurveyMonkey, Google Forms, or even an email if you'd like, right? To capture um, some quick items that allow you to get at people's functional expertise or their context experience. So you could ask what is or was your major if they're graduate students? How much experience do you have working in virtual teams? How proficient are you in are your skills in things like using Zoom, Dropbox, Panopto, Google Apps, whatever the technology is that you're bringing to bear. If you're using geographically dispersed teams, right, like many of us do in online environments, simple things like what is your time zone, right? And trying to create teams that are based off not only functional expertise, but context experience that will smooth the team uh, work that needs to happen, smooth the collaboration and, and coordination that needs to happen. So as we move beyond this idea of just building the team, what about setting up the teams for success, for better performance? Well, we know from uh, the research literature that clear expectations and responsibilities help establish productive norms and dissuade unproductive norms, right? It all starts from the get-go, as they say. And when we're thinking of our roles in this as instructors, some things to avoid or cease doing really surrounds this idea of certain mindsets that we want to avoid that really can come back and haunt us uh, downstream as we run these team projects. One mindset is a real hands-off approach, you know, illustrated by, ah, oh, they'll figure it out. Another sort of mindset that doesn't work very well, it's a bit dysfunctional, is the discipline-only focus. Well, I don't teach teams, right? I'm an accountant, right? or I teach strategy, or I teach marketing, or so forth. Well, that's, that may be true, that's the content task work side, but you are using it in a team environment. So if you don't consider and think about the teamwork part of it, it's only gonna create headaches for you downstream and your students are gonna be less successful and learn uh, and acquire less knowledge on the things that you care about most. So what are things we should start doing here? Well, first and foremost, discuss your expectations. So what do we mean here? Be very, very clear right up front what you expect. What are the intended goals for learning? Not just the subject matter, but why are you using Teams? Tell them that, right? Well, this is the way it's done in real life. All important strategic decisions are made by top management teams, for example. Talk about your expectations for effort and be very clear and specific. You expect people to be engaged, to be professional, show respect. Talk about your level of involvement in the team project. And again, be detailed here. Are you gonna be a facilitator or an advisor? Are you helping them through their decisions and individual tasks? Or are you more there just for, to field questions when they have problems? Try to sort of articulate that up front for the expectations. And then here, as much as you can include project requirements, procedures, rubrics, the processes you want them to follow, this is absolutely essential, right? Clarity, clarity, clarity. Another way to sort of uh, better prepare teams is use synchronous kickoffs require team charters or offer team training. I'll, I'll allude to these, the middle two here in a moment in a bit more detail. So again, offering team training, again, more effort here as indicated by the orange pointer. So what I mean here is perhaps you build a model or have a short reading, um, a mini lecture on uh, what does a good team look like? How do you effectively engage in project management? How do you run a team meeting? And you offer these supplemental training modules for teams to engage in. Again, requires more effort, but the payoff um, can be rather substantial in minimizing some of the hassles downstream for you as an instructor. So let's take a, a little bit of a dive into this use a synchronous kickoff, okay? So what we know from research is that face-to-face -face interactions facilitate team development, especially early in the formation stages of teams. But because this is extremely difficult in the conditions we face now where most of us are completely virtual, we need to try to create opportunities that come as close as possible to these face-to-face -face interactions early on in a team uh, formation. So one way to do this is to have synchronous kickoff uh, meetings, right? And what makes these work best is if you build in, you bake in structure. 
So here's an example of the, the agenda that I often use to make sure this kickoff meeting is structured. There's, some, there's a bit of a part that's a meet and greet where people get to know each other, a little bit about one another, a section around their personal goals. So what do they want to get out of this experience, get them thinking about the project, any kind of concerns or worries they might have, and then get into that key information about their availability, how they prefer to communicate, and then ending with perhaps the most important component, they work through a team contract, a team charter, right? Which is another recommendation you can see on the left. So let's talk about what that team contract looks like, what a team charter looks like. So a team charter, and you're looking at one right now, in this essence is an agreement about how the team will work together towards the common purpose. But the thing about a team charter, it's a structured exercise that teams go through. And they literally answer these questions that you see in front of you. You can add more or have fewer questions, but they all touch these kinds of areas. So they're, they, the team's working through these synchronously and, and answering these questions as a group. So you gain consensus. Things like how will we asset, handle, handle disagreements? What are our expectations for follow through? Timeliness of communication? Is meeting attendance required? How often will we meet? How long? Right? How are we going to prioritize the way we talk? How are we going to hold people accountable? And you have teams work through this. And at the very end, um, the, the entire team uh, physically, I guess in this, in this scenario, virtually signs the charter. You literally have everyone sign the charter. It becomes a binding contract, if you will. It's really good to then encourage teams to post this charter to their shared project pages, if you use that, um, or even begin each team meeting uh, with an image of the charter right there. Um, you know, if I'm meeting in face-to-face -face teams, I, I tell the teams, look, you should actually bring a copy of the charter with you. The idea here is to keep it fresh, right? To keep it top of mind, to remind them of their obligations. Um, and as you'll see later, the team charter really helps you deal with non-compliance and some other kinds of performance issues downstream. So now that we've talked a little bit about, you know, ways to help team projects begin well, let's shift to tactics uh, for improving team projects while they happen. OK, and so what's interesting here, if we think about this idea of teams performing, most of our headaches as instructors and the source of frustration among our students come from problems of working collaboratively as a team. And in many of these problems around collaboration really begin with team members thinking less about the team and more about themselves. Right. So it's sort of going from a, it's about the team to it's all about me. Right? And so the idea here is how can we recognize when these problems are beginning to percolate right, at an individual or team level? And what we know from research is that a lack of self-awareness in teams leads to ineffective social interactions and poor team performance. So it's not just bad actors. It's oftentimes people really don't even realize they're performing poorly. They're acting badly. Right? So that is often teams and team members fail to recognize that the team's dysfunctional or that they're not even contributing uh, valuably on their own. So as an instructor, you want to avoid or try to cease some things that uh, unfortunately uh, propagate this. So assuming no news is good news, try to avoid doing that, right? Uh, using the same evaluations for both development and grading, they should be distinct, right? Uh, in, in the case of peer evaluations, for example, don't use the same peer evaluations you do for development and the ones you use to do grades. Also, if you are using peer evaluations to help uh, teams improve and to recognize problems, don't assume just because there are really good peer evaluations that the team's high functioning. Especially early in a team's life cycle, there's a tendency to overestimate, for people to overrate how good things are going. Or if it's too early, they just haven't worked together enough to even recognize some of these behaviors. So what are some things we should start doing? Well, a lot of our LMS systems, as well as some uh, of the uh, technology that we use, the learning technology we use in class, um, allows us to examine rates of participation. And you need to be proactive about this. So are you looking at logins? Are you looking at time spent? A lot of our LMS systems, will, uh, will you can automate reminders um, and simple checks and, and gain reports on how often people are visiting and how long they're staying in different sections of your courses. Capsim products, you can check who logged into different simulations and how often did they in Teams. 
This allows you to sort of gauge what's happening before it becomes a problem. And just tell yourself, set a routine for how often you might look at these. There's no rule of thumb, this must be done once a week, twice a week, every other week, but the idea is some sort of regular check-in. There's also a, a way of sort of addressing and recognizing the problem is providing developmental feedback about teamwork and going even a step further if you want to put forth more effort. When there is a problem, require individuals and teams to create the improvement plans, how they're going to actually fix this while it's happening rather than waiting for it to all fall apart at the end. Let's just take a little bit more time um, and talk a bit about this idea of developmental feedback. There are a lot of different ways you could approach this to deliver developmental feedback. I actually have a colleague at another university who directly observes student teams, even in virtual environments, sits in and observes the teams in order to provide feedback. Uh, you know, this works fantastically, but it also requires a lot of time. Personally, I, I couldn't really make that work in a lot of my courses. At DePaul, uh, we used uh, a product called Teammate, it's actually a Capson product, to provide our, the real-time developmental feedback during all of our team projects. And I like this tool personally. I've been using it, gosh, uh, six, seven, eight years now maybe, for quite up some time. I like it because it's based on team science. It's a validated measure. Um, and it has two different assessments, one that's for grading and then one that's for development. And like we said, it's important to separate those. And the developmental part, the reason why it's really valuable to sort of help recognize problems is that it, it taps into these key dimensions that at the team level and the individual level, you can see these on the screen. Um, and these things, once teams come in and evaluate, it's a peer rating system, it'll kick off specific developmental tactics to the individuals and to the teams to help them improve. So they go through the assessment, it gives them information on how to reduce that conflict, how to increase the cooperation. And it's all sort of evidence-based suggestions, which is fantastic. Basically, it does my job for me when it comes to developing, uh, excuse me, providing uh, developmental feedback, which I really like. So whatever approach you're taking, if you're utilizing a peer ratings type uh, approach, to provide developmental interventions or provide developmental feedback, I'll leave you with two really, really important tips. You need to admonish students to be brutally honest and do this more than once. Tell the students verbally and in writing, when they do this, they need to be brutally honest because it's all about their own development. It's about building a better team. You have to admonish them to, to, be, to be straightforward and candid, and then you can get it. Don't assume they, they'll just um, be candid and honest. If you're going to do these kinds of, of, of uh, assessments, make sure you do them at least twice, right? I would, I would say don't do them four, five, six times. I mean, maybe two, time, two times, maybe three times if you're in a longer course. Your project spans throughout the entire semester, for example. But you want to do it at least twice, and it needs to happen kind of early on, do not do a pretest because they haven't worked together yet to recognize if they're doing well or poorly. So do it sometime early on and then later on in the team's uh, life cycle, the project life cycle, to give them that developmental feedback that they need to improve. You know, what if we turn to handling non-compliance? Well, what do we know in research? From research, it says teamwork begins with individual level behavior, but it ends with team level consequences, right? It's, it's people coming together to achieve that collective goal. So here again, there are some mindsets that really can make our job more difficult than it should be, um, than it needs to be when we're managing our team projects. So here I like to think about you know, the, the leadership literature to frame this. We want to avoid laissez-faire leadership. So uh, the teams, they'll just work it out on their own. Or being very um, a, a lack of proactivity, passive detection. Well, they'll let me know when there's an issue. I got a lot of other stuff to worry about or take it on a case-by-case -case treatment. Well, I'll worry about it if and when it happens, and then I'll deal with it on a case-by-case -case basis. What happens is when you take these mindsets, it really does make your job more difficult at the end. You create more headaches, uh, you allow these problems to fester, and then uh, oftentimes you're addressing them after you've already given out the project grade, and there's no opportunity to, to nip it in the bud um, and get people to sort of self-manage uh, uh, the, these problems within their teams. So for you as an instructor, it's really about taking, engaging in some proactive actions ahead of time. Things to start doing or um, applying and creating. Establish a career grievance procedure. Allow for firing a team member. So I imagine uh, there's some eyebrows went up when you see that fire a teammate tactic. We'll talk more about this in a moment. 
have a backup uh, alternative individual level assignment. Or for those of you that actually that want to do even more, put forth more efforts, you could teach feedback or conflict resolution skills. You could have a special module on how to deliver feedback, how to resolve conflicts. Maybe you could uh, go walk uh, walk down the hall and knock on a, well, I guess we're not doing that, send an email to uh, an OB professor, or someone from the management department and say, hey, can you send me a module on conflict resolution and post that to uh, your course website? So this idea of backup or alternative individual assignments, this is really important not only for people who might uh, be fired or dismissed from teams, but it's also really good to have these prepared ahead of time to address other kinds of issues that we face, such as absences due to illness and other kinds of complications that we're certainly facing at a more frequent level now with our COVID-19 afflicted um, times we live in. Those of you who uh, use some CAPSIM simulations, I'll give you an example here. So you're using CAPSIM simulations for team-based projects. So here you might have a foot race mode as the individual level assignment for people who are dismissed from a team or who, who need some uh, uh, different, have some other circumstances to address. Let's turn to this idea of a grievance procedure or the sort of firing a team member. What I'm showing you here is an actual policy that I use in my classes. And you can feel free to take this and paste it right into your syllabus if you'd like. And so here you can see, I'll read the first, uh, first bit to you. Here it says, you know, on all team projects, you must adhere to the mutual contracts set forth in your team's charter. Again, here's the team charter. If you have problems with your team members, you must first attempt to solve those problems on your own using the following process. And so here, step one tells them to directly address the issue at hand. It gets them to do something about it, set a specific time frame uh, within which that person or persons needs to address their behavioral issue. Step two then says, well, if it doesn't work, what do you do? And here's where I get involved. At the very least, they need to CC me or copy me in the communication. And then eventually step three is when uh, the steps the team needs to take when if the problem still persists. And one of the options is they could uh, seek dismissal uh, of that person from the team. But that only comes from pre-approval from me before they can, quote unquote, fire a team member. You know, I've been using this approach for a very long time. Uh, Firing someone is actually quite rare, believe it or not. In fact, it hasn't even happened in, in any of my classes in the, in the last few years. Um, it seems that the threat of being fired, that people know this could happen, as well as the actions in step one and step two, are usually enough to motivate change in people. Not always, but usually seems to be enough um, to motivate people to change their behavior and start contributing. So let's move from dealing with problems to facilitating success, right? We'll sort of talk about some positives here. And so when we're talking about facilitating success, we really want to boost collaboration because we know from the research literature, communication, cooperation, coordination are essential to team effectiveness. And so here, you know, if we're thinking about things to avoid or cease is too much asynchronous communication or too many communication options. So your communication in a virtual environment, there needs to be some life to it. It can't just be only emails or only postings or only things that you're putting up for people to read. There needs to be some dynamism there because we know that dynamic communication not only impacts students' reactions, they're more favorable to you as an instructor, but it also drives up learning, right? It allows for uh, more direct real-time feedback. Uh, look, having options is great. Uh, but to avoid a lot of confusion and misuse of those options, it's best to narrow them down or at least specify which mode of communication it should be used for what purpose. So use email for this, use instant messaging for that, right? And specify what you want students to use within their teams. We also want to avoid assuming a lot of communication equals high quality communication. And then finally, we really want to uh, avoid undervaluing the impact we have, our direct and live interactions. Look, uh, I imagine many of you have been teaching for many, many years. Live interactions matter so much in our own classrooms under normal circumstances, but each opportunity takes on exponentially more importance in virtual environments because they're infrequent by definition. So it's really critical to keep this point top of mind, so to speak when you have these live interactions, these direct interactions, how you can best leverage those and use that time uh, as wisely as possible because it drives up positive reactions and drives up learning, as we know in a lot of, of research on virtual learning. So let's take a look at some things you 
could start doing here? Well, when it comes to boost, boosting collaboration, we want to encourage both open and unique sharing of information, have scheduled times for monitored synchronous project work where you're there participating while they're working, require retrospectives or after action reviews, and then finally track and reward communication quality if you want to put forth even more effort. I have a colleague at DePaul that reads and evaluates posts and team communications and scores them. Again, this allows a, a much deeper dive into team dynamics, but it also requires a lot more time and effort on your part. Let's take a closer look at the first three tactics, though. So what we know from a lot of research on, on team functioning, and especially virtual teams, is that there's different forms of information sharing. There's what we call open sharing, and there's unique sharing. Open sharing is how much the volume of information that's shared among team members. Unique sharing is you're sharing information that's not known by the majority of team members. You're sharing something new or unique. Now, research tells us that both forms of sharing are essential for team performance, right? Although from a practical standpoint, the unique sharing seems to be the tougher one to focus on within virtual student teams. Right, We can get them to sort of increase the volume, but how do we encourage them to share things that are unique or may not be known by the majority of team members? And so here the, the main point is thinking about ways we can encourage that kind of unique sharing. Perhaps you require the teams to use uh, or have living documents right, within uh, sort of a shared file, a Dropbox file, a Drive file, or create high, high priority communication pages where people put things up there that they think everyone needs to know that are largely unknown. There's a lot of different ways to kind of create this, but the, the key is to think about fostering both open and unique sharing in your team projects. This idea of schedule times for monitor or synchronous project work, um, regardless of the technology you use, Zoom, Google Hangouts, and so forth, uh, having preset times for synchronous project work Right, where it's real-time project work that you can actively monitor, that you're there um, virtually, a virtual presence is extremely impactful. There are many ways to approach this, but here are like two tips that improve uh, these kinds of virtual, um, these synchronous project events. Try to schedule them around uh, some class-wide event. So maybe it's a concise lesson or module for the whole class. Maybe it's a debrief session you're doing for the entire class, for those of you who use simulations. And so you have them show up for a synchronous lesson, a short uh, lesson or a short debrief. And then afterwards, use breakout rooms, right? So those of you who use Zoom, you literally use the breakout room function. And But you need to use these breakout rooms wisely. So be sure to go around and visit each team, even if they're performing well. Pop in, ask questions, make sure that you have that presence. And then remain online for the duration to field those questions. Avoid the temptation to pop off and say, well, they'll let me know if they have problems, right? So the key notion here is that it's all about bringing teams together to work, right? And to ensure them they're, they're not doing all of the project work asynchronously, because that's where a lot of problems happen with collaboration. If all the work is done asynchronously, so you're creating these um, preset times where you're you're forcing the teams to come together and then you're there in support of their project work. As an example, when I use multi-week simulations uh, where teams have to sort of make these decision sets every single week, I usually leverage maybe one or two um, synchronous project events early on in the term when I know they're going to struggle the most. And then I have an event just after the midterm as well where I force the teams to come back together and work synchronously while, while I'm there. Um, again, the key notion is to ensure that not all the work is happening asynchronously. What about this idea of retrospectives and after action reviews? So another way to boost teamwork is to require basically systematic self-evaluation. These are just as important as team charters. In fact, if you can only remember two things to do come fall, I would say team charters, after action, or retrospective reviews. These things will move the needle immensely. And so what an after action or retrospective review really is, is a structured uh, exercise that teams go through where they address key questions, as you can see on the screen. Uh, what was supposed to happen? What really happened? Why were there differences? And what can be learned? And then at the end, they walk away with shared commitments they have to list. What should we do more of? What should we do less of? What should we start doing? What should we stop doing? 
So the key here is to get them to work through the systematic uh, debrief, if you will, a systematic evaluation. So a key question here is when to have these reviews, right? To answer this is actually simple. Just ask yourself, what are the natural breakpoints or milestones in your team project? At the very least, all team projects have some sort of midpoint, right? Some sort of halftime. Once you've identified the natural breakpoints, then insert a required review, right? What are the key milestones and make sure they do the required review there? I, I typically grade these, but I only grade them pass fail because what gets measured gets done, right? I grade them pass fail to ensure that there's adequate completion, but also to minimize the amount of evaluation that I have to do. So we've talked about a lot, we've covered a lot of ground here, I, I think. We've talked about ways to set up teams for success, ways to facilitate in-process work. Let's finish with a discussion of tactics that deal with making sure learning is actually happening in our team projects. The thing we care about the most, right? Ensuring that learning is happening. Of course, we hope, our, <laughs> we hope students learn more than this from their team projects. So my fingers are always crossed for this one, right? So for thinking about learning, it's really about ensuring total learning, individual and team level learning. And what we know from an awful lot of research is that team contexts facilitate or inhibit what the individuals gain from that learning experience. The, the teams they're in matter quite a bit of what people will take away from these learning experiences. And so some things we really want to avoid here is ignoring the effects of teams on individual level learning. Ignoring the fact that if the team is dysfunctional, you're really, the students are going to walk away with not only a terrible experience, but not having acquired the learning you want them to acquire. We also want to, to, to avoid assuming that team success means individual success. Just because the team did well doesn't mean that every individual knows what happened or knows what's going on or learned the same amount. We also want to avoid exclusively focusing on topic or subject specific debriefs. Right, so only debriefing the team project or, or evaluating the team project on the subject matter. You want to also integrate the aspects of teamwork as well. And so well, let's talk about some of these tactics. Well, link success or failure to team dynamics. Require that the project deliverables actually discuss task work and teamwork. The first two tactics here really relate to infusing the effects of teamwork on task work. That is, you're conveying how the team's outcomes or deliverables are specifically shaped by how well people work together, the team dynamics. And I'll provide a few examples in a moment. Also, if you wanna go uh, sort of beyond the call of duty here and engage in a little bit more uh, effort and work, you could also assess individual level learning after the team project. So for example, I know many of you use uh, CapSim uh, sim business simulations like Capstone or Foundation. You know, you could also use CompXM after that, right? So when they go through the simulation as a team, you could have them go through the simulation as an individual using CompXM to see if they can demonstrate the learning on their own. Another, another approach here, if you want to go a little bit beyond the call of duty, a little bit more effort, is to offer remedial training for those that are in problematic teams. Look, we know from tons of research that if individuals are learning in teams that are performing poorly, especially those that the cooperation and information sharing levels are low, they're probably not going to walk away with a lot of knowledge acquisition, right? So you can use that as a key to offer remedial training. So additional content, additional learning modules for those team, people that were in teams that were low performing or low levels of cooperation. The hammer home that content you want to teach. So let's take a, a closer look at, at, the, at the first one. These are just sort of some suggestions of ways you can link how teamwork matters to the team deliverables. And so I'll just show you some examples here. It's about probing, um, getting people to think about the impact of the way they interact with the products they produce. So in classes, for example, where I, I use a lot of simulations, um, team, that make, team decision making is key, right? It's around how they make these decisions. So one really relevant subject here is this idea of different decision making biases or pitfalls. And you probably recognize many of these like confirmation bias, base rate fallacy and so forth. So I'll include these probes um, in my debriefs or at the very end when we're talking about overall um, team performance to get them to think about things they might have done that contributed to poor outcomes. For example, did your team spend most of its time discussing what worked instead of what worked and what didn't work? 
or jumping down to the base rate fallacy? Did your team spend more uh, time um, and emphasize some data over others, right, when they made us decisions? Or framing effects, did your team emphasize gains or losses rather than both gains and losses? And then talking about how these things might have shaped the decisions that they make. Another way of doing this is simply infusing into the deliverables they have to provide you, whether it's a paper, a presentation, um, and these kinds of things. Uh, ask team-related questions. Have them infuse these into the project papers, the project deliverables. For example, ask them, did, you, did your team adhere to the charter? What were the areas that the team had difficulties or failed to follow and why? Did your team discuss or revisit expectations or effort, or effort throughout the project? How effective were your team's adjustments after its retrospectives? The team actually followed through. Looking back now, what are some improvements you would make? And so again, the idea is that getting them to not only focus on the subjects you're trying to teach, but that teamwork relevance, right? How to work more effectively with others. Because we know in today's organizations, most of our graduates are gonna find themselves working in teams at some point in their career. Finally, what about this idea of evaluating performance? Well, what we know from a lot of research here is that uh, when you're thinking of evaluation, delivering grades, perceptions of fairness are key. How can we foster perceptions of fairness? And here, what we also know is that it's primarily driven by the procedures we use for evaluation. Um, in the literature, we would call this procedural justice. And so things to enhance fairness are very, very specific. So it begins with avoiding or ceasing some things we've talked about already, like using the same evaluation for development and grading. You want to separate out things that are used for, for development and learning from things that are used for evaluation and grading. You also want to avoid giving too little or too much weight for that team project and the overall course grade. Is there a magic uh, sort of proportion here? No, um, but you have to sort of use your judgment. If you're going into a, a course, most courses, and the team project is worth over half or three quarters of their entire grade for the whole class, that's probably pushing it. Even in medical schools, they don't do that kind of grading schemes. Or the opposite, if it's only worth about five to 10% of their entire course grade, they're probably gonna put forth much less effort towards um, doing really well. Another thing to avoid is scoring only the outcome, not the process by which it was produced, right? And so what we're really talking about here is including teamwork as part of your overall project score. One way to do this is, is to use anonymous, a keyword, anonymous peer ratings to capture how each individual contributed to that. And then also think about your due process for the challenges about grades and have that specified in your syllabus. When you think of due process as, as, a, as a chance for someone to, to, um, to put forth a challenge. I have a very key, clear process in my class if they don't like what happened, they have to put it in writing within an email and send it to me with a case. They have to build a case for why they feel the, 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 the score is incorrect. And then I tell them, I will look at this, review the evidence and adjudicate. You can use kind of that legal language, adjudicate whether or not a change is warranted. So if we're thinking about this idea of including a teamwork score, basically you wanna be clear and you wanna be concise in communicating whatever that is to students. They should not be surprised at the end, how you grade their team project, right? So it's some sort of aspect of teamwork plus task work equal the project score. So for example, maybe you use peer evaluations plus a, a group presentation plus a paper to deliver that final grade. You wanna make sure you have enough teamwork project points to play that's worthwhile. Um, if it's too little, they won't care. So for example, you might have a peer evaluation worth 15%, the debrief they give versus worth 20%, and their simulation performance, if you use simulations, 65%, right? This is what I use in my class. Enough points at play that they care about it, right? And so when you use peer, peer ratings to do this for grading, there's a couple key tips here. First, you want them anonymous because this helps ensure honesty, that people tell the truth. Remind students, often that peer evaluations are part of their project grade. Right from the get-go, have it up in your syllabus. When you do the project kickoff, remind them again and again. I'm very, very blunt with it. I say, look, those of you who think you're going to slack and not pull your fair share or not, not pull your weight, uh, it's gonna come back to get you. We have peer evaluations to catch those slackers. And I make it very, very clear to people. Um, another tactic that, that I found useful and I know a lot of my, my colleagues do as well is require justification for those ratings. If you're worried about 
um, people overrating, or you're worried about a lot of challenges um, that might come from students to their grades, require some justification. For example, whenever students give lower ratings, have them write in why they gave that person a lower rating. Or if they're giving really high ratings, write in some justification for why that person deserved the high rating. And then lastly, keep that peer evaluation simple and relevant. Simple and relevant. Don't overthink it. And make sure you're measuring the stuff that matters. As I alluded to earlier, um, I use Teammate uh, to also evaluate my teams because remember it has the developmental and evaluative component. So what are some aspects that are relevant to team projects? Obviously the quality of work, the quantity of work that's provided, and people being accountable, showing up to meetings, participating, meeting deadlines, and these kinds of things. Um, the evaluation component in Teammate, I believe, is about 12 items, and it covers things like the, the quality of your contribution, consideration of others, detail-oriented, you're giving your fair share, you're attending meetings, you're providing timely communication, and so forth. Um, but the key is here, keeping it simple, and you're, you're rewarding or punishing effective or ineffective contributions. So we've covered a lot of ground here. I, 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 we can see all the, the little tactics we've, we've touched on around getting the most out of your team projects and hopefully retaining some sanity as we come into the fall here. Um, things around using synchronous team kickoff meetings, team charters, retrospectives and after action reviews, open versus unique information sharing, all the way into making sure that we uh, grade both taskwork and teamwork. Um, covered a lot of different uh, kinds of tactics here. I very much hope you found this valuable and that it makes your fall term project, team projects more productive and seamless for you and engaging and effective for your students. I'm hoping that you find at least a nugget here that you can start applying right away. Um, I thank you, and I'm going to pass this back to Jordan now to say a few words, um, and then we, can, we have plenty of time here to field questions uh, that you might have along the way. Jordan? Thank you so much, Dr. Deerdorf. Uh, a lot of great information there. Uh, I'm just looking at the questions and the feedback from everyone. Uh, a lot of questions here, so hang tight. We'll definitely get to them, um, and if you stick around to the end, I, I'm sure a lot of you have some of these questions. Look, the, the product teammate that you mentioned uh, several times just now, uh, I wanna just share right now, I'm really excited, excited to share that it is currently free. It will remain free uh, until June, 2021. And this is part of Capsum's larger response to COVID-19 impacting all of us in the classes we teach. So for the upcoming academic year, it is free for you, okay? And we also have an entire suite of products that are uh, designed to work seamlessly in a virtual environment. And based on who I see in attendance today, many of you, uh, I know that you use our simulations. What you may not know is that we have recently launched a feature called Capsum Chat. This is really focused on helping students collaborate better together. And that includes, so Caption Chat has instant messaging, video and audio chat, lets them share their screen and their documents, even work on a collaborative virtual whiteboard. Over the last few months when we've launched, since we've launched it, we have received just incredible feedback from professors and students uh, that really love this new feature. You know, I, I led this webinar off by talking about how, you know, the, the whole impetus of it was based on a survey that we uh, gave out to our professors. And one of the other things that they were really looking for are other activities that work well in, of course, face-to-face, -face, but also virtual uh, environments. And we have an, in a really impressive platform called uh, Capsum Inbox that allows students to experience the day in the life of almost any profession focused on a given theme. So that could be anything like management, ethics, strategic marketing, Think of this like a simulated virtual internship that lasts anywhere from 30 minutes to a few hours. And it gives students immediate feedback uh, afterwards to let them know how they performed in a variety of skills. And if you don't even see a topic, it's all on the left there. If you don't see a topic that you want to use in your class, we have uh, an authoring platform where you can create your own micro simulation. It's really neat stuff. But look, at the end of the day, we want you to be as successful as possible. That's why we're holding this webinar. It's even baked into our values here at Capsum. So if you are interested in getting access to the free teammate product uh, through June 2021, 
or if you're interested in learning about any of our other products, please reach out to us. Uh, you can email us uh, via welcome at capsum.com. I encourage you to also uh, just type in one, type the number one into chat right now or into the questions and we'll just trigger, we'll, that'll trigger us to say, all right, we can reach out to you and, uh, and, and you don't even have to think about it after this webinar. So uh, I have a couple other announcements at the very end, but let's open it up to some Q&A, uh, Dr. Deardorff, if you're ready. So one of the things uh, that came up very early on, so if we think back to the beginning of the webinar, so why around the topic of forming teams, Dr. Deardorff, why should we avoid self-selection? Right, this is, a, this is a really good question. I, I knew as soon as I said that that was gonna come out. Um, so self-selection, is no, it really comes down to, the short answer of it is it comes down to subsequent uh, collaboration and cooperation problems, right? So oftentimes you can think of it as like team cohesion or the formation of cliques, okay? So in face-to-face -face environments and when you sort of know your class, who's involved, you kind of, you kind of maybe you've seen these people before, had them in previous classes, or maybe they're seniors, so they've, they've know, they do know a lot of people in the class, then self-selection oftentimes can help, right? But even then, some of the costs are these people choose to work with one another, right? Then you always end up with one or two teams of stragglers whom you just sort of throw together. Um, and then you're setting up different teams at dis different disadvantages because they don't know one another. Or you're putting teams in, you're putting people in other teams where a few members already know each other really, really well and you create clicks essentially. And we know from a bunch of research around cohesion and performance that these clicks can be a real collaboration killer. Right, these people only work with one another instead of with a full team. Now, you can still make these things work really, really well, but in virtual environments, it becomes really difficult. Um, it's not that it, 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 it's sort of like you could run it because you don't want to deal with it, right? Just because, like, um, logistically, maybe it's easier for people to self form. But if you want to sort of set it up to where you're allowing teams, you're trying to set them up for some, some more success. You know, I would encourage you, particularly in a virtual environment where we have a lot of communication problems anyway, is really to at least pick a couple factors that are really relevant. Because if you think about it, wouldn't you want to set up teams where people who've had a lot of experience using Zoom or some of these virtual tools, you'd want them sort of spread out across different teams. So at least there's one person on each team, if you will, that has some experience in using these tools. So it's really not so much about Self-selection is going to damage the teams and make it really, really hard for you to manage. But it's more about uh, what are the things I can do that will have a bigger bang for the buck and setting the teams up for success. It's kind of a long-winded answer there. Great. Thank <laughs> you. My first question. It's always going to take me a while to get warmed up. All right. Uh, a lot of interest around uh, the topic you brought up about uh, firing a student. So if someone <laughs> is fired, yeah. Are they then responsible for all the group work themselves? Yeah, so th this is a really great, great, it's a very great practical question, right? Because you can imagine worst case scenario, someone gets fired a week before the deliverables do, right? And you, you sort of can see that happening, um, you know, and that that does happen. That's happened to me in, in the past before. Uh, you know, the idea here is when they are fired, it's part of the the uh, the, the responsibility of the team to pick up that slack. But typically when people are dismissed from the team is they haven't done the work anyway, right? And so the idea of having this procedure in place, not only does it give people, um, teams themselves, a way to, a way out, if you will, to actually go and, and file a grievance against this person who's underperforming earlier in the project instead of waiting all the way to the end, which is when it usually happens, right? Earlier in the project, they can raise this to your attention. That way, there's not as much uh, um, undone work to recover by the team. Now, the individual who gets dismissed, the way I do it, as we sort of talked about on that slide, is there's an individual project they have to do, right? They just have, they have to sort of do that. Um, and that's part of the, the problem of not pooling your fair share, right? Not pooling your weight in the team. So I think that addressed the question, right? Great. Did I, did I... Perfect. All right, um, this goes back to your uh, examples of unique versus public sharing or open sharing. Yeah. The question goes into, can you provide an example of unique 
sharing that's contrasted to public or open sharing? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, this is a really good one. And, you know, there's not, I, I really wish there was a really good sort of techno technological tool we could use that I could recommend that would make this even easier. Um, so really it's gonna vary by the kind of project you use, right? Are you running a simulation or are they doing a market analysis? Or, you know, are you a history professor and they're doing some sort of large scale historical analysis on some event? Um, so the way to think about it is open sharing is really about how you're how often they're talking with one another. So you can monitor this as an instructor, right? How much engagement is happening through group chats or postings or email threads and the, these kinds of things, right? Um, the unique sharing, though, is really about the idea of encouraging people to share information that they don't know or they think other people don't know, right? And so if you're, let's say you're doing a paper that's around some sort of market analysis, right? And I'm a team member, you want to encourage individual team members who may have found a really unique source of information uh, that's relevant to the entire team's task, the entire team's project, to share that immediately. What happens in teams is a lot of times that team member will just sit on that and assume that other team members know of this resource or of this tool, right? You want people to share that high priority stuff with the team more frequently, that unique information. Another example is if you're running a simulation and, and some person is paying attention to say the marketing decisions where someone else is worrying about the finance decisions, for example, or the operations decisions, you want them to introduce things they've discovered in their own domain to the rest of the team more quickly rather than waiting until after a decision has been made and there's problems that people are experiencing within uh, uh, as a result of that decision being made. So one tool that I've used is I've, I've required my teams to have like a, a high priority list that uh, or a high priority post or a, or a living document on uh, within the group page I use in my LMS that they put forth anything that they think that's extremely important that a lot of people probably don't know. And it can be links, it can be resources, teams have structured in all different kinds of, of ways, and it's really helped. Um, I was worried early on that people would post too much stuff there um, or nothing at all, and, and it has not happened. As long as you explain what kind of information you want there, it, it's worked quite well. Great. Great. We're going to do a couple more questions. I, there's no way we can answer all these questions uh, today in this webinar because it's already past two o'clock um, and we said that we'd keep it to two, but a lot of great uh, things coming on. By the way, for those questions, we're going to put all of the questions, I'm going to compile all of this um, and put it onto our professor community forums. So when you go into capsum.com uh, and you log in with your professor account, we've launched a new community form for professors uh, in the last couple months. I'm going to put them there and I know I'm going to get, I'm going to bug Dr. D, uh, Dr. Deardorff to uh, also share some of his insights uh, on that form as well. Uh, another question, Dr. Deardorff, uh, this is around the evaluations. So uh, all the team evals that you suggest are actually individual peer evaluations or do you assess team effectiveness in other ways? Can you explain uh, that a little more? That's a really good question. So. The short answer is you, you want to do both. So no matter what tactic you take, you need to assess individual level contributions and then overall collective contributions, right? So for focused, typically we do this on the task work side, don't we? I mean, we, we, we give a grade and that's like you're grading the quality of the tasks that they completed. But on the teamwork side, you know, you want to really focus on capturing both levels. Um, and so you know, the, that's another reason why I like the teammate tool, quite frankly, because that's already built in. So um, if at the individual level, people and teammate are rating each other and themselves on these individual level teamwork behaviors, how much they prepared, executed, adjusted, and monitored, I think, right? And they're really specific behaviors that they rate themselves and others. But they also rate their team on these higher level team variables, like how much cooperation is happening, how much conflict, um, is the team cohesive, do we coordinate? So you're getting both levels of feedback, which is fantastic, right? And then you can use that to, to, to leverage interventions to fix problems or to continue doing things well. From a grading perspective, um, it really comes back to more individual level factors. Because think about it, 
you got to give it when we give grades we're giving grades to individuals so for evaluation for grading purposes the things you're assessing really are individual level things like were you timely in your communication did you show up to team meetings did you meet your deadlines you know there's there's five of us did you contribute 20 percent you know to the team's success and these kinds of issues hopefully that clarified that's a really great question Great, thank you. All right, last question. Again, there are so many other ones, and uh, we'll, we'll post those in the community. I'm more than happy. I'm more than happy to go through them, Jordan, and and fire up some thank answers. You. All right. Uh, how do you deal with grade appeals based on group evaluations and dismissals? Is the dean backing? Is the dean actually backing your approach? Uh, this is good. So every every university has its own policies, right? Um, you know, and I imagine many of you have been to that. Basically, it's like a court <laughs> when when there's grade challenge and these sorts of things. Yeah. So the, the short end of it really is that, you know, early on when I first before I started sort of system systematizing and making these procedures really clear, I had all kinds of problems. I mean, you know, it, it it's really difficult. But if you have clear procedures like the grievance procedures, you, you tell them how grades are being evaluated, you assess teamwork and task work, you know, you, you have all these things built in. And uh, the one thing that's really helped me, besides all the clarity and the procedural sort of, you know, being very systematic, is when I capture those peer evaluations for grades, um, I ask for justification, right? You know, there's a there's a part in teammate, for example, that you can have writing comments. And I tell students that you need to give me evidence. Tell me what that person did that was great. Tell me what they didn't do that was not so great. And that's helped immensely when students come and they complain like, oh, my team hates me or they're lying. I, I, I actually did a bunch of work. You know, I can respond with saying, I hear you. I understand you feel that way. But there was remarkable consensus in your lack in, in your lack of contribution. And I can use comments from that students have given me as a real life examples. You know, you've missed multiple deadlines despite having reminders from your team. And so I can give them real life examples that were given to me um, of why they didn't perform. And you know, that that right that in and of itself resolves you know 99% of the problems. Now, of course, you're always going to have a student that no matter what you say is still going <laughs> to take it a step further. But there's really not a whole lot you can do except for making it very procedurally fair and just and, and transparent. Hopefully that Great. answers your question. Absolutely. All right, we'll do one last bonus question because we're coming up on about 210. And again, we'll we'll have answers to all these other questions and the ones that you just answered, uh, Dr. Deardorff, in our professor community forums. All right, this this is around uh, the role of the professor in uh, when they're kind of working with the teams. So do you suggest using uh, a set of questions to cover, or would you rather guide the team members' interactions during their team meetings? Yeah, th this is a really good question. Um, I would consider at least three things, right? So one, how comfortable are you in delivering that kind of intervention, right? Um, you know, depending on your your training and your background right you might feel very comfortable in sort of facilitating team decision making and these sorts of things right so that that's a really important thing to consider uh, most of us will feel comfortable on the task work side right because we're teaching that content so we might be able to give teams guidance of things to do and avoid during the project around this the specifics but we may feel less comfortable advising them on how to make decisions and engage in cooperation and all of those so you have to sort of think of that the second thing is, well, how much time do you have, right? You know, how is your course structured? How much is that team project worth in the overall um, course? How much, how much time is dedicated to that? Because that's pretty key. Because the more you get in, your fingers into it, as you might imagine, it's a lot more pressure on you as an instructor to be able to sort of monitor and do all of that. And then the, sort of the third thing is, really, you know, how much can you offload some of that uh, support? Right. And so a lot of the recommendations I gave here, you remember the little orange uh, triangle, if you want to go a little bit farther um, in some of the support, you could build some of these support mechanisms asynchronously. You can have short modules on how to, you know, how to how to uh, run an effective team meeting. Um, 
you know, when you go in, I, Jordan said team made is free, which is fantastic. I, I didn't know that. <laughs> That's great. Uh, in teammate, there's actually a, a PDF called the teammate toolkit. And it has things like, how do I run a team meeting? How do I deal with someone who's a social loafer? You know, and these kinds of, of, of tactics that you could have up there for teams to use and encourage their use. Um, and I've also developed sort of some team checklists that people can use as they sort of go about their meetings. Are they engaging in this behavior or that behavior? If not, why? To try to take a little bit of it off of me. Um, so hopefully I'd address your question because it's a really tough one. Uh, it really, you really have to think about how comfortable do you feel delivering these things, how much time you have, and then how much can you really offload in support materials that you encourage the team to use. Those, um, the synchronous uh, project work sessions, those events that you have where you bring everybody together and you're there popping in and out and, and around, that also can help in the virtual environment. Of course, in a face-to-face -face environment, this is a heck of a lot easier. You're walking into rooms and seeing how they're working together. Virtual environment, a little bit more difficult for some of this, pure live sessions. But that would be another opportunity to to pop in and observe how people are speaking and talking and sharing information. Great. Well, look, thank you so much, Dr. Deirdre, for uh, holding this webinar uh, for all of our, our customers. Uh, it was absolutely insightful. And thank you to all of you for attending the webinar. The webinar. Um, I have a couple of quick reminders. Um, first of all, we will be sending out a recording to you uh, as well as the slide deck. So please share the recording, share the slide deck with your colleagues. I know a couple of those things have, uh, those questions have come up. You absolutely can share that. Um, expect that maybe later today, no later than tomorrow. Uh, we also will be sending out some helpful documents uh, and information as well. So Dr. Deardorff just talked about the teamwork toolkit. Uh, we'll pull that out from our teammate product and actually send you the PDF document of that. Uh, of that as well. And that gets into things like, you know, how to uh, reduce social loafing or deal with that in your teams. It has that team charter that was one of those must do uh, action items. Also, please keep the conversation going. So while I'm going to post some of these frequently asked questions and all the different questions that were that were posted, uh, don't just wait for us to respond to them. Uh, share your your thoughts and your insights as well um, from all of your experience. And last but not least, reach out and uh, please don't be a stranger to us. You can email us, uh, welcome at capsum.com if you're interested in learning about our products and solutions. Again, before you leave, you can type uh, the number one into chat or the questions area, and we will reach out and connect with you to figure out what your needs are. Thank you all so much. Have a wonderful day. Take care.